East meets West at Utah's Promontory Summit, the spot where we just celebrated the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad. As John Blackstone explains, East met West there in more ways than one. It's something railroad enthusiasts believe they might never see again. One of the biggest steam locomotives ever built back on the tracks, rumbling west under its own steam. As Union Pacific number 4014 pulled out of Cheyenne, Wyoming, crowds lined the tracks, waving at engineer Ed Dickens, urging one more pull of the whistle. I don't know what it is about that whistle. We hear whistles, we hear horns in our life, but the steam locomotive whistle is really something that just, it just moves you. Dickens led the small team of Union Pacific workers who spent five years toiling to bring the massive machine back to life. Just give me some idea of the scale of this. I mean, these wheels are as, almost as big as we are. This is 17,000 pounds all by itself without everything else hanging off of it. 4014 is one of just 25 locomotives built in the 1940s, aptly named Big Boys. 132 feet long, weighing more than a million pounds, producing 7,000 horsepower. But when the age of steam came to an end in the late 1950s, 4014 became obsolete. Until Dickens and his team brought it back to life. Their goal was to get 4014 rolling again in time to celebrate one of the greatest rail accomplishments ever, the Transcontinental Railroad, built at the urging of President Lincoln. It's very humbling that all of the sacrifice, the tremendous human effort to build something as complex as a set of railroad tracks across territory that many people have never even been across before. Crews worked from both the east and the west, finally meeting on May 10th, 1869 at Promontory Summit, Utah. And we call it the moonshot of the 19th century. It was impossible. It was an impossible dream. At Golden Spike National Historical Park, rail fans dressed in style to mark the anniversary. Hello. If not always with historical accuracy. President Lincoln, this was all your idea, was it not? Uh, I wasn't the only one that had the idea, but I was thankful to have a big part in it. Replicas of Victorian steam engines rolled in for a reenactment of the legendary photo celebrating the driving of the Golden Spike. But the faces in that photo from 150 years ago look much different from those gathered here this time. It took 150 years to gain that recognition, so our history is now coming alive. They are descendants of the Chinese laborers who made up about 90 percent of the workforce on the western portion of the railroad. The workers on the line who cleared the way for the railroad, who laid the roadbed and laid the track and laid the ties and so forth, and then especially did the tunnels, was almost exclusively Chinese. Gordon H. Chang, a history professor at Stanford University, is the author of a newly released book on the Chinese who built the Transcontinental Railroad. The gold rush had brought thousands from China to California in the 1850s. When construction of the railroad began in 1863, the Chinese were not the first choice to work in it. There was belief that they were either temperamentally or physically unfit for railroad work, but workers they hired on did very, very well for them. They were very, very pleased. Ultimately, they hired up to 20,000 workers. Not only was the Chinese labor force plentiful, the workers were paid less than whites doing the same job. And the work was hard. They took on the most challenging portion of the Transcontinental Railroad, California's granite mountain range, the Sierra Nevada. Fifteen tunnels had to be blasted, carved out through the Sierra Nevada. The Chinese carved out those 15 tunnels, the longest one being over 1,600 feet in length, and it took more than two years using only hand tools and black powder. In the newspapers of the day, Chang found recognition for the contribution the Chinese rail workers were making to a growing nation. To read the history... Jeff Lee, a retired dentist from San Jose, California, is inspired by the hard work his great-grandfather did. They don't come over as Hulk, right? They come over as pretty much me, right? And they learned to adapt to what they had to do physically, 
mentally, emotionally, as uh, individuals and as groups. And Lee is proud of where these tracks have taken his family. Doctors, uh, dentists, architects, UC Berkeley, Yale, Princeton. But soon after the railroad was finished, the nation's mood began to turn against the hardworking immigrants. With the rise of the anti-Chinese movement, the earlier history of what they did in California is erased. The Chinese are driven out in town after town and their homes destroyed. The Chinese became undesirable and therefore you don't want to include them in the history of the country. That erasure is what the descendants gathered at Promontory Summit wanted to set right. So this is Lim Lip Hong, my great-great-grandfather. She came here when he was 12. So he was on his way back to China, but he stopped in San Francisco and said, no, this is my home. I love America. Much has changed in 150 years for families and for the railroad. The old steam locomotives that originally traveled these rails were replaced by massive machines like 4014. But even this giant had to finally give way to modern diesels. Still, there is value in preserving the memory of all that came before. The locomotives, the tracks, and those who built them.